Welcome to another session that we have in our course, Object-Oriented Programming. So in this lecture, I'm gonna continue finishing what we have started in the last lecture, which was about uh, inheritance, right? So we were basically doing inheritance. In the last lecture, we were trying to understand uh, another important concept of OP. So far we covered, uh, as you know, we covered about data encapsulation. We covered uh, the get and set methods. We covered the concept of abstraction, making the classes fall into the same category and treating them in the same way, even though these classes are completely different from one another. I think we, I have also solved this exercise, right? the animal, uh, the dog, and the bird exercise. Haven't we? Anyone can help us? Did we solve this? Yes, sir, we have. Yeah, very good. So this one, I think I didn't solve in your group. Is that correct? Yes, the second one, we didn't solve it. Okay, then this is where I want to start. And originally we were supposed to have a quiz today, as you know, but uh, last minute they let me know that there are students' elections in the labs the whole day, so they cancelled my class yesterday night, and uh, I was like uh, very in a in a very tight spot, so I had to uh, cancel the quiz. Your quiz is going to be next week, obviously. Okay, so it has to be face to face. So we're gonna do it next week. So don't worry about it. Uh, we just pushed it a week ahead. About this exercise, let's see how we can solve it. This exercise is about, as you can see, inheritance because there's the child and parent relationship going from this class to that class. As you can see uh, in the lecture slides that we have described before, when you create uh, a parent child relationship, the arrows would always go from the child class to the parent class. This is like uh, how it is done in inheritance. So this will establish basically a many to one, or it depends on how you want to read it, a one to many relationship in between these classes. So whenever this happens, the child class extends the features of the animal class or whatever class they have and inherits all the methods that are public and protected. Also, all the vari variables that are public and protected. As a matter of fact, we have been using this for some time, but perhaps you didn't know its meaning. Perhaps you didn't understand what extends mean before when you extended the J-frame. But now you do. This, as I said, establishes an is a relationship. So whenever you go there and uh, form it, you technically allow the square to be a shape, rectangle to be a shape, and circle again to be a shape. So whatever is defined here as protected or public, it automatically transferred to these classes and you basically use the one you like. So in a question like this, what you need to do is you have to solve first the super class, in this case, the shape class. That is where I'm gonna start doing uh, solving the exercise. Having created the shape class, we will move into and create the child classes, each one with a feature as you can see and base on these classes, once they are finished, we will create a run class and then put these shapes into a shape array and display their calculations of area and perimeter. Did you understand the question? Because understanding the question is basically halfway through solving the question. If you don't understand it, there's no way you can start solving it. So let's make sure that you understand what is being asked to you. Is it clear? Yes, sir. 
let's go and solve it then. I'm going to go into my NetBeans. And I already created a project called, uh, I'm going to enable my magnifier so it can basically see it better. I already created a project called inheritance exercise in here. And there's a run class that I already have, which is basically the default class. This is going to be shapes run. So I'm going to come in here and rename my class. So let's, let's go refactor, rename, and then I'm just going to name it as shape run or something. So it just falls in line between what the question was asking me to do. So it was not this one. It was in the question that it says shape runs, right? Yeah. So I'm ma making this basically in line with the question. Now that I have the main method, the main run class, I can go ahead and create the shape class. So I'm gonna go into there, new Java class. I'm gonna name this as shape. From here onwards, we're gonna basically follow the UML class diagram in order to create our class. So you gotta check your UML a couple of times in order to know the variables, the methods and so forth. We have three different variables here. We have A, B and shape name. So we're gonna go and create them. You have to create these inside your class. So this will be protected integer my keyboard to English, protected integer A and B. You can do it like this. And then we also have a string, which is the name. So going into here, we have A and B being integer and shape name, which is the string. Let's shape name. Oh, this is lowercase. Now, going into there, we have three different constructors. One of them is empty, the other one only accept A value, and the last one, A and B. So you can obviously write them down should you want to, or you can insert the code and put the constructor there one by one. One of them was empty, so I'm not selecting anything. The other one only accepted the A value. And the final one accepted A and B. In the exam, you will have to write these things, right? Don't tell me to auto-generate them. You have to write them down. But because we are behind an editor now, I'm using the auto-generation features just to show you that you don't have to type everything. Next, we have calculate area and calculate perimeter also set and some uh, a get method. I will do the set methods first because it's easier for me just with the insert code, we can create a setter and set up which ones you want to set, which will automatically set them up. Make sure to follow the guidelines here that are given, this is A, B, but this is N, as you can see. So I'm gonna go instead of shape name, just make this N and make sure that this is N as well. This is just for the sake of following the guidelines that are given to you. We also have a get name, which again, you can put it here, insert code, getter, select the get name, which in this case, the shape name, and it's named as get name. So put it there as well. So this one is not shape name. I'll get rid of it. And this one as well. So it's gonna be get name and set name. That's it. So for the last two methods, we have calculate area and calculate parameter, and they return double values. So you can put them here, public double, calculate area. It doesn't accept any values, but it has to have a body here. We will actually solve this exercise in a more advanced way when we see the abstract classes. I think that will be a much better solution. 
But for now, we have a calculate area, as you can see, and it returns a double value and it's public. So in this case, you can simply come in here and type return zero, just for the sake of having a body. And you can do the same thing for the parameter. In an abstract class example, these functions will be abstract, which we will solve later on, and they will not have a body. They will have their bodies in the child classes. But for now, we don't know about abstract classes. So we're gonna focus on just creating a body that is empty and it returns zero. And I think that's it for the shape. Any questions so far? Anything you did not understand you wanna discuss before I go further on? Is this clear? Did, do you understand how I transfer the UML diagram into the code? Can you be a little bit responsive? Thank you, some people are responding. So let's go, continue. So when you come to the child part, you can start with whichever one you like. Just because I listed square first, doesn't mean that you have to do the square first. You can literally start with circle, then rectangle, then square. It doesn't matter which one you start, but in a question like this, you must have the first the superclass because without superclass, it is not possible to have the child classes. So I'm gonna start with circle instead of square. So I'm gonna come in here, right click, new Java class and name it circle. Now, when you look at the circle, it has actually a value inside which is a private value, which is pi. So that's gonna be double pi, which is private 3.14. And that's what I'm gonna come in here and type private double pi 3.14. This is a value that is only available to this class. No other class can see it because it is private. And we have a constructor, which is circle. So we're gonna put our constructor circle. Look at the constructor. It has one value inside, which is R. You wanna put integer R, but then we have to use the right constructor inside. Look at your shapes example. Which one of these have only one value? You have the shape one. So we're gonna enable that one. To enable the constructor, we use the keyword super and pass down the local value you have. In this case, super i. But super i doesn't work yet. Why? Because we haven't extended the circle. So we're gonna come in here and extend this shape. As soon as you do this, you will come in here and type super and pass down R. Now, as you can see, the super R, it doesn't give us an error message. It works now. Before I extended the shape, it was providing me an error message, but now it doesn't. So this is it, I think, for the circle. Then we can move to rectangle, then we can move to square. We will eventually need to overwrite the methods for each shape, but that is in the question too. In question one, it just says that create these. So that's what I'm focusing now. I'm gonna come in here, create the next one, which is the rectangle. We can extend the shape just as we did before. And in here you have two items. A and B. Again, you can put the insert code if you want to. You can put the constructor, select the two style one, the, the one that has two variables, and will automatically put the super, as you can see. You don't even have to type it manually. When you type in front of a computer, you can simply write them down and auto-generate the code. 
the trend in the new computing world is to type less code and to tire developers less and less. So many things, even uh, in game programming now, let's say everything is so visual. We just drag and drop a couple of boxes. So programming be becoming a visual tool rather than typing the text, okay? Many of the uh, IDs today, they provide services that you can just, with a couple of clicks, you can do a lot of stuff. All right, so that's this rectangle. And we're gonna go into the last one, which is the square, I think, right? Was it the square? Let's check it out. Yeah, it was the square. So we're gonna create a square and finish. Once again, I'm gonna erase all of this unnecessary parts and extends the shape. And once again, you can put the constructor that is relevant to this specific part. In scare, you only need one of them. So you just select that one and generate it. So all these classes, square, as you can see, square, rectangle, circle, they are all created. They're all there. It's done alongside with the shape. So we can move, even the shape run is done, but so that means question one is solved. Create the above class hierarchy, create a run class named shapes run. Then we will have to overwrite the calculate area and calculate parameter for each shape. So let's do that. We're gonna come into here to each one of these shapes and we're gonna overwrite the functions. There are many ways that you can use to overwrite. You can simply type the overwrite keyword if you want to and come in here and type overwrite. When you do so, you are basically telling the computer that, here's my add sign, overwrite. You are technically telling that you want to implement a method that already exists, but you want to change the content. This is called polymorphism in programming. And as I said to you before, you can actually do, do this in setting code again. You can see the overwrite method functionality when you generate it, and you can basically select the code, select the part that you wanna overwrite. When you put the overwrite on the top of it, it means that you that method actually exists somewhere. In this case, that somewhere is the shape and you want to change the content of it. Right now, the content is only returning zero, but you wanna change it. So we're gonna basically get rid of all of this and change what lies inside. It is already saving Ahmed. Ahmed is asking, can we save this? It is already being recorded. So don't worry about that part, all right? Just focus on understanding what we are doing here right now. So we have the calculate parameter, calculate area. What do we type here? We will have to calculate the area of this specific shape. Now, based on your primary school knowledge, you should know the area of a circle that is pi multiplied by r multiplied by r. But when I type r, there's a problem it doesn't understand what R is. Why? Because in the super class that you have, when you pass the R, the R becomes actually A. So if you look at the constructor that you are following in the circle, when you pass the R value into super, it comes to here and it becomes A. So because you are using an shape class, you are an extending or an extension of this shape class, you don't have an R value. 
the R value is just a parameter inside the circle constructor. There is no R value. There is A value. So when you calculate this, we have to type A here because this is the value in the constructor. This is the value that you use inside shape. Now that you have this, you can return. which will, as you can see, sort out the problem. This is a trap that most students fall immediately. Because I define an R value here, they assume that they will calculate the area. This is not the area, by the way, and no one is warning me. This is the area. And what you need to do in here is that you have to look into the values of your super class rather than the local class, unless it is listed in here under the class description, the values that pass from a parameter is not usable. It is only valid within that specific constructor. So there is no R value. The value that you assign R is A because it's A in here. So you say this A, A. So your R becomes automatically A you can use the A value, not the R value. Don't fall into this trap. The same example can also be done for the perimeter. In case of a perimeter, we're gonna type two times pi times R, but we don't have R, we have A. So we're gonna return perimeter. Do you understand this? Any questions? Hello, anyone alive there? Yes, sir, it's clear. Okay, let's move on then. We're gonna have the same things for rectangle. Now that I understand how to do it, I'm just gonna use overwrite method, as you can see, calculate area, calculate perimeter, generate. It generates the functionalities automatically. And I'm going to get rid of them immediately because I don't want to invoke the super one that will return the function to zero, which is not something I desire. For rectangle, the parameter will be, let's define it, two times A plus B. We pass A and B values here, and those values are also A and B, so you can use them in here, but you don't have to always use A and B. These could have been side one and side two. Remember, if you pass them down to side one and side two, there is no problem. But in here, you still have to use A and B because in your class, in the parent class, they are defined as A and B. Regardless of what you pass here, they will become A and B. So be careful. Whatever you pass inside the constructor is only valid in here, all right? This A and B and this one actually are different. It only becomes the same at this specific line. So be careful about these things. It can help you a lot. And once you have calculated this, you can return the parameter. We will also have to do the area. So we're gonna put double. Area. This is fairly easy. A multiplied by B, return area. So that's the rectangle. Let's do the uh, final one, which is the square. The square is the easiest one. Just put the override, put the methods, delete the content of the method. And we can say double parameter. This will be four times A, return A. And this one, not return A, return parameter, sorry. And this one will be double area, A multiplied by A, return area. 
So, so far we have rectangle, we have circle, we have square. All shapes are done and every one of them is extending the shape class, which is basically containing a bunch of constructors for each one of my shapes to be used, a certain uh, get method for name. And in case that the user wants to use the empty constructor, they can also use set A and set B, up to them. So now that we have this, we have to move into the next phase of the question, which is question three, create a square of five-sided, a rectangle of two and four-sided, and finally a circle of five radius in the round class. So we're gonna come into our round, we're gonna create each of our shapes. Since I created the circle first, it doesn't really matter, but I'm gonna start by creating the circle again, which in the question it says that the radius is five. So that's exactly what I do. Then I'm gonna create the rectangle, rectangle R, new rectangle. This will be two and four. And finally we have square, S new square which is, what was it? Five. So I'm gonna put five here. It is also a nice idea to name each of your shapes. Even though this was not given in the question, I would still do it. Because it will make it easier for me to read the shape names. Would that be an easier approach basically? also give us a excuse to use that method that we created so this one is going to be square so i have a circle rectangle square great so we created them what do we do with them all of this is created in the next one this should be question four for some reason i type question three put shapes into a shape array Iterate shapes, show the name of each shape and calculate the area and the parameter to show either on the console or in a JOption pane show message dialog box in the round class. So it says that we have to put them into a shape array. This is a form of abstraction, basically. When you put the shapes into one place as a collection and you treat them the same, you technically allow this to be, uh, allow each object to be treated as one, even though all of these objects are completely different from one another. So if you look at a circle, rectangle and square, they're completely different shapes. They all have different kind of calculations for calculating their area and perimeter but regardless of their shapes, their areas and perimeter, they are still shaped. So you can still put them in here into a shape array and store them. So let's put that into the shape array. So I'm gonna put a shape and call it shape array and then put them in here, every single one of them. In this case, C, R and S. It's inside the shape array now. Now I can iterate each shape and treat them the same in the shape array. So this is going to be shape in shape array. So you see, even though these shapes are completely different because they are still shapes, I can treat them as the shape type. And now that I have the shape type, I can actually show whatever shape function has, such as the get name, calculate area, calculate parameter, I can invoke this, but because the class is overriding it, it will never return zero for the area and perimeter. It will actually return their own functions. So let's do that. I'm going to put a string output here, empty by default. And each time a shape is displayed, I'm going to put a backslash n, show me the shape name. 
in this case, each shape, get name, show me the shape area, put it in here, area. calculate area, and finally shape parameter. This will be shape parameter. It will be also a nice idea to put a, I don't know, not C out, this is not C. So this will be some lines maybe just to differentiate each shape from one another. And then another backslash, just to show the output in a nicer way, you know. Once this is done, you can show it in a J option pane message dialog, or you can show it on the console, whichever you prefer. So as you can see now, I put the for loop here, iterating the shape array, which my shapes are C, R, S. When you create an array, technically, I call it my array, we put numbers here, right? Like two, four, five, isn't it? Isn't this how you create a regular array? Yes or no? Are you sleeping? I ask you a question. Is this how you create a regular array? Yes, somebody answered, thank you. That's exactly what I do. Instead of integer though, these are actually objects. This is this and this are exactly the same. The only difference here is that you have the objects, not the numbers. And because you have the objects, you can actually trigger the methods. But when you trigger the methods, it will not trigger the shape method, it will trigger their own methods because you are overriding it. So it will, as soon as it realizes that there is an overwritten functionality, each shape will trigger their own area and their own parameter. Let's run this thing just to see the outcome. Oops. This is the shape one, so I'm running it. And as you can see, I can see each one of these shapes here, shape name circle, shape area, shape parameter. Maybe we can use a decimal format for this one. If you wanna you know, format it, you can do that. And then underneath this, there's a rectangle, shape area, shape parameter, and finally square square area, square parameter. Did you understand this exercise? Do you understand how I sold it? Oops, these are some other exercises. Let me just close a bunch of them. Any problems about these exercises? Anything you did not understand, you would like me to repeat and so forth. You understand? Okay, very good. So if I give you an ex exercise like this in the exam, you will be able to do it, right? No problem. Yes, sir. Okay, cool. Uh, I am in the last four minutes now, so I'm gonna close this session and open another one and send it to you on BB. And we'll do the second part, which is the chapter nine. So I'm not gonna, I finished the chapter eight, which was about inheritance. And there are two exercises here, which I solved both of them. And now I wanna focus on chapter nine, which is officially the very last chapter. Okay, it's the last chapter of our course. And then I'm not going to do any exercises. Also, my assistant, Nasser, you, you met him, I assume. He goes to the lab sessions and I told him to solve the chapter eight. I told him to supervise, not to solve. 
chapter eight ending exercises, the ones at the end, this one, the train one and the train one and also the cat and the dog one. So he's supervising these exercises, I think in the labs. So make sure to attend, he might solve it or he might help you out to solve it. So please go to the lab sessions if you need more practice. Hello guys, welcome to uh, the second part of our course. So what I'm gonna do here is to basically go into our last chapter. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. In this chapter, we're gonna discuss about up, uh, the last leg of uh, obviously the last leg of our course, which is the abstract classes and interfaces. That's what I'm gonna discuss in here. So what we're gonna do in this session is basically, we're gonna improve the exercises that we have solved even further in terms of abstraction. So, so far in our course, we have discussed, as I said, data, data encapsulation. On the top of that, we discussed abstraction. Having done so, we moved to the part where we did inheritance, just as we did it, you know, in, in the last session. And finally, we have done uh, the exercise for the inheritance where one class can be inherited by multiple child classes and a child class can only extend one parent. Now, what we're gonna do here is that we're gonna improve this concept even further. And we're gonna basically uh, look into how we can uh, improve the existing exercise, particularly the one that I just solved, the shape exercise. There are some unnecessary components here. And then many of the things that we have done are actually optional. So I'm gonna basically solve this exercise in a different way, in a different approach, just to show you how it can be structured in a better way, all right? So without further ado, let's get started. An abstract class is technically uh, is a class that has the abstract keyword in front of it. And what it does is basically it allows uh, other classes to extend it, but different from regular classes, this class will never have an object. So this is a class that will never be instantiated. It will never have an object, okay? Another important feature of abstract class is that it includes, it is an optional thing, but it can include abstract methods. And when you create an abstract method, that means that that method is basically enforced to the child classes. So when you say an abstract method exists in an abstract class and the child is basically extending this class, this means that whatever you define as abstract method, must pass down to the child. The child must modify its features. The child must overwrite the function. So technically in the example that we saw, let's go back to the shape example, which we're gonna solve it again. It is up to you to overwrite this methods or not. So even if you delete this, it's not gonna affect anything in the program. It will only affect the result of the shape because now that the shape doesn't have, obviously a specific uh, calculation for it to be done, it will return automatically zero. Let's look at the example. You see the program didn't give us an error message. It will still calculate the circle and rectangle, but when it comes to circle, it will show it zero. Why does it show it zero? Because in the shape, I already said that if you don't overwrite this, it will return you zero. So if you put it back, it will basically calculate the square. But even if you remove it, 
this will not create a syntax error, right? It will just say that it's zero. So in that case, the class that we write does not enforce it to the other ones. It's not something that you must do. It is something that you offer as optional, all right? Where in the abstract classes, if you type a method that is abstract, you don't type a body to it. You just put a semicolon and you don't define a body for it. And the body itself is actually defined in the child. So an abstract class in short gets the keyword abstract in front of it. It's a class that is created as a template for other classes. It is not a class that is gonna have an object. It will never actually have an object. It is a class that you will use just for the other classes. The abstract classes can or cannot, it's up to you to include abstract methods. If it does, this means that the abstract method must be enforced to the child. It means that the child must have this specific method. Otherwise, it will give you a syntax error. If a class, if an abstract class, let's say, has nothing but abstract methods, it is then called an interface, which is what we're gonna discuss in the next lecture, not in this one. I wanna discuss that, uh, not to overwhelm you, I wanna discuss that in the next lecture. But for now, what we're gonna discuss is the abstract class. So an abstract class basically serves as a template for another class, something that I already mentioned. The class that extend the abstract, abstract class can use variables and method, just like a regular class. Once an abstract class is extended, the class extending the abstract class must have the abstract methods. Again, something that I already said, these methods then modify according to the needs of the extending class. This is also the purest form of polymorphism probably because now instead of making polymorphism an optional thing, it is a must thing. You must have it. There is nothing that you can discuss or it's not an optional thing anymore. If you define something abstract and extending it, if you don't have it, the class wouldn't even work. It will give you an error. Up to this point, did you understand the meaning of an abstract class? Is it clear? Someone mentioned that uh, they cannot hear me, but I think my microphone is working, isn't it? Can you all hear me? Yes, good. So that person, you can restart your computer if you want to. Other than that, did you understand the logic behind this? Is it clear? Like, uh, I know that we haven't solved an exercise yet, but on the conceptual base, like you understand what is an abstract class. Here's an example to it in terms of representation. So when you put the abstract doc class, the keyword abstract, this means that this class will never have an object. The actual classes that you have underneath it will extend this class and get their properties here. If you put a bark method, let's say inside your abstract class, let's say that this one has a bark method then you force the bark method to have in every single dog that you see here. So the husky will have a bark, the golden retriever will have a bark, the border collie will have a bark as well, but each one of these dogs would bark in a different way. For example, huskies, they do not bark usually, they howl just like wolves, okay? Where a golden retriever enthusiastically howl, uh, sorry, enthusiastically uh, bark, like saying woof or something like this because they're very friendly dogs. And the border collies usually they whine, okay? They're a bit dramatic, so they will mind. So if you come in here and you create your class as abstract and put the method, the bark, you will see that each one of these dogs will do it in a different way but regardless, they will all have the method. And now it's not optional, they must have the method. 
one of the key differences between an abstract uh, method and a regular method, and again, the key difference between abstract class and a regular class in the UML class diagram, you will see that these are represented as bold and italic. So if the UML class diagram, you see the method or the class name being bold and italic, then you should understand that this is abstract, okay? Then you must use the abstract keyword. As I said, each class extending the abstract class must have all of the abstract methods. This is not an optional thing anymore. So when we go into each one of these exercises, you have a public abstract class doc. The doc has an age and a name, and then you have an abstract void bark, as you can see. The method you indicated here, you see there is no body for it. There is no actual brackets that telling you what to do in the bark. It just shows the name of the method, and then there's the semicolon. This is the big difference between regular methods and the abstract methods. The actual body of this method is defined in the Husky class. So when the abstract method is put into here, now the dog can do something with it. And only this one will be activated when it basically barks. And you can do this in a different way in every single dog. So every one of them will be having this method. So you have some kind of consistency. Even though the, these dogs are completely different from one another, you see they have different names, different age, different breed, and so forth. Even does things in a very different way, then it is still have a specific structured constructor that looks alike. So you can make them an abstract concept and put them into one class as doc and relate them. So you can, in short, this is all done to reuse the code as much as we can and also to use the memory efficiently. So to understand this exercise further, I want to revisit the shape exercise and solve it. This time, solve it in the abstract class. Rather than using the concrete classes like I did in here, rather than just create a regular class and extending it and making things optional, I want to use abstract. Okay. So, did you understand what I'm going to do? Is it clear? Let's do it together. So, Java application going to here. Abstract class shape exercise. It's going to be shape run or whatever. I'm putting a run method here. And I'm just closing. Yeah, closing every single one of these classes because I don't need them anymore. Even the start page, I can close it. And this one. Too. So I'm going to close these projects as well. And then I have shape run, which means that I'm having a new project. In this project, I want to create a bunch of shapes just as I did in the previous exercise. But this time around, solve it with different shapes. Let's put a triangle here instead of square and also create the shape class as abstract. So how do you create it? We're gonna come in here, new Java class and name our class. In this case, this is gonna be shape. We're gonna finish it. And the first thing that I'm gonna do here is to put the abstract keyword in front. Now, when you create a shape class, let's create an empty constructor for it. Just an empty one, you know doesn't even have to do anything. When you want to create an object for it, let's go and try to create an option. Technically, you can say shape equals to new shape, but you will realize that this will give you an error. 
now. And when you go and wait on the error, it will actually tell you that shape is abstract and you cannot basically create an object for it. And if you remove the abstract keyword, whoops, if you remove the abstract keyword and save it again, you see this time, this one works. There's no problem with it. It shows us that you cannot create an object for the abstract classes. You might also realize that the icon changes. Right now you see this one is just a regular class and this one has a play icon next to it. And when you go there and type abstract in front of it, you will realize that the icon is there like transparent, you see? It indicates that you cannot have an object for it. More or less the other editors apply this in the same way. So you can create a constructor for it if you want to, but it cannot have an object. As soon as you go there, it will give you an error, okay? So there is one big difference between concrete classes and abstract classes. The abstract classes can never have an object. They're not designed for that. Now that we understand this, we're gonna create an abstract and as you can see, we have three different shapes. Each one of them will have an area and also a parameter. So I'm gonna use a bunch of values here just to represent each shape. So going into here, I'm gonna type protected integer A, B, and C. So A1, I will only use it for circle. The A and B, I will use it for rectangle and A, B, and C, I will use it for right angle triangle. Optionally, you can go there and create, you know, one variable will make any difference. If you want to separate your R as a different value, you can do so. Like I said, it's something optional. For each shape that I create, I will also create a constructor. For example, for circle, I will create a shape or the rectangle I will use A and B and finally I have a triangle this is a right angle triangle and I will use A, B and C so I'll be four. Right angled triangle. So we have like three different shapes, as you can see, each shape will refer to one constructor and it's an abstract class. For this one, I'm gonna also have the name, protected string name. And I'm gonna put a get and set my tools here just for the name and nothing else. Now getter and setter, set, set a name, get name and set name, perfectly done. And now I will have two different abstract methods. Instead of typing the body like I did in the last exercise and saying return zero, I will actually not type the body and say that these are abstract. So I'm gonna say abstract double outlet error and put the semicolon here. As you can see, nobody, nothing inside the method, just the method and the semicolon. And I'm gonna put the same thing for there. So what difference does it make from the previous exercise? Now, the difference is when you create the circle or triangle or the rectangle, they must have this. There is no option anymore for them. If they don't have this method, the program will give you an error message. So when you create an abstract method, you are forcing your child to have this. There is no other way that they can exist without this method anymore. That is the big difference between the regular methods that you inherit and the abstract methods. 
For example, this is a regular method. The child can have it or it cannot have it. It can use parents uh, method. Think of it like your own car and your father's car. If your father's car, if you live in the same home, is a car you can access. You can use your father's car, even though the car belongs to your father. But if your father puts you a restriction and tells you that you can't use my car anymore because I'm going to go to work with it and I need it, so you have to buy your own car, that becomes abstract. Does that make sense? The difference? Even though both of them can have cars, the cars are different now. Okay, let's go and create our shapes then, now that you understand the difference. First, I will start with circle. And as I go and extend the shape, as soon as I extend the shape, it will give me an error. See, let's extend it and put shape here it will give me an error. Why does it give me an error? Because I don't have the methods. If you go and wait on it, it will tell you that you don't implement the methods properly. Come on, show us. Press Alt and Enter and it says implement abstract methods. So you can click on it if you want to and it will automatically put them in there should want to do so because now you must have these methods it's not like you we can argue with it anymore it's yelling at us to have these methods the error however still continues because you must also use one of the constructors of the shape so one of them you must use it the one that i want to use is the one that accepts only one value so i'm going to say circle integer r and then come in here and just say super r which will fix out the errors as you can see we still need to type the body for the calculate area and calculate parameter so this is going to be double area let's define a pi value here private double I three point so the area will be now because your shape has an R, you can use the R value. In the previous example, I wasn't using the R because I didn't have an R value. Now I have it, so I can use it. I multiply by R, multiply by R. And we're gonna say return area here. And we're gonna also do the same thing for the parameter. Two times pi times r, return parameter. As soon as you do this, you see all of the errors are gone here. There's no error anymore. And if you zoom in, you will see that circle is a concrete class, shape is an abstract class, and shape run is basically a run class. So each one of them, as you can see, have a different shape. This is a concrete class. This is an abstract class. This is a run class. So understand the differences, please. Because when someone talks to you in software engineering terminology, you can know the differences. If you try to delete these methods now, Previously, in the example that we did, when we deleted them, it didn't prepare, it didn't create any problems. But if I try to delete them now, look what happens. I get an error. And I see the error in here. It doesn't even allow me to continue. Now, this class has an error. The only way to get rid of that error is to put the functions there. Why? because those functions are abstract. They, it, they must exist in the child. That is the big difference between abstract and regular ones. Now we can create the next one, which is the rectangle. And we're gonna use the same pattern as we used before. Rectangle, 
I don't need any values here because the values are already defined in my parent class. So that's extending the parent, which in this case is the shape. I'm going to put a constructor that fits into my class, in this case, A and B, and put the super there. Also, overwrite the methods. Overwrite the methods. It will, whoops, implement the methods, not overwrite them. Implement the methods. So you have the area and the parameter. Overwrite and implement are a little bit different. Why? Overwrite is something you do optionally. It's up to you to override it or not. Do you want to upgrade something that already exists and do something more with it? Then you can overwrite. Implement means you must use it. It is not something we can argue, okay? So abstract methods are implemented. Regular methods are overridden, okay? Even though they both use the keyword overwrite, this is an implemented method. It is not overridden. So we go into here and type the next part. Double area, A multiplied by B. And we're gonna do the same thing for the parent. Here, two times A plus B. And now, once again, all of the errors are gone, right? Let's do the last one, which is the triangle. It's the right angle triangle. So I'm going to use the same name for it, right angle triangle. The difference is here that you have a hypotenuse. So let's put the constructor for it. Whoops, not this one. Insert code constructor. Ah, I forgot to extend it. Now it shows me the one that has three values, A and B and C. And now I'm gonna implement the method, not overwrite, implement. And put it in I don't want any exception because I'm gonna actually type a body for it. So assuming that these are, let's call it base, height, and I for tennis. We can pass them down. I for tennis, height, and space. How do we calculate the area? Double area, height, multiplied by base. Not height and base though for our application, it's gonna be A and B, right? Item base are valid only here. So this is gonna be A, this is gonna be B. And we're gonna return it. And we're gonna do the same thing for parameter. Parameter is A plus B plus C. And we're gonna return parameter. All of these, as you can see, are done using the abstract. And if I try to get rid of the abstract methods, it will always give me an error. So you are kind of forcing a specific structure to be followed in your programs, okay? That is why you can create an abstract method and an abstract class. That is like the huge difference between them. If you have all the methods abstract, like your class doesn't have regular methods, but all it does have it, let's say that in the shape, all you have it just abstract methods and nothing else like this, it will be called an interface. 
Instead, you can literally go there and type interface. But this is something we're going to type later on, not now. In the next lecture, I will show you how you can do this. As you can see, I don't get an error. But for now, we'll just keep it as an abstract class. And now that I have all of this done, I can go and create my classes. Let's go and create them. I have still 10 minutes, so I think I can finish it in 10 minutes. So circle C, new circle. Let's use the more or less the same numbers. So that's circle. Let's use a rectangle, R, new rectangle. So two and four here. And finally, the triangle, which is the right angle triangle. Be new. That's a long word. I'll put it in here. Two, four, six. And I have all the objects, right? Every single one of them. And you can follow the same structure as you did in the previous exercise. So you can technically treat them as shape inside the shape array. So the rest is basically fairly similar, C, R, and T. And now you can even put them in here. Each one of my shape, S, inside shape array. And put them the shapes while it's over there. Okay. So what do we want to do? We can create an output like we did in the previous example. Empty and each time you want to add something on the top of it, you can put the names and so forth. So let's put a backslash n. It will be nice if you add names for each one of these, as you did in the previous example, like circle, rectangle, or just triangle. And now if you want to show them, you can simply access to their state by using the shape. So the shape name and this will be shape area which is going to be s dot calculate area and the last one will be s dot calculate parameter And I think that's it. And that's all we need to do. We can put uh, some lines here just to separate the shape. This, this is just for aesthetic purposes. And if you want to show it on the console or on a JOption pain message, you can do so. Let's put now here and the output. If you want to just show it on the console, let's put it both of them together. So print LM and just put output here. So when you run this thing now, as you can see, each one of them creates the shape. The shapes are named, they are put into the abstraction, and instead of invoking them one by one, like see this, see that or are this, are that, I treat them the same. So this is abstraction. This is data encapsulation, right? This, the one that we did here is polymorphism. And finally, this is inheritance. So in one exercise, you use every single feature of object-oriented programming, as you can see. So now we can go into here and run it just to see the outcome. So I can run this thing, whoops, the output didn't show anything to us. So we need to go and uh, find it. Sir, 
It's yeah. plus equal, not equal. It's plus equal, yeah? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, just, you know, my mind is somewhere else. You are right, let's put the plus equal. And it's there. Thank you for fixing my error. I appreciate it. And yeah, as you can see, the example is done. And if you press on OK, it will also show it in here as well. Any questions? Did you understand the concept of abstraction? Is it clear? Is it not clear? Hmm? There's an exercise actually uh, on the Moodle. I put you an extra exercise. If you click on that, you will see this exercise there. Examine the following UML class diagram. Please notice that bold italic stands for uh, abstract. So you have a person, there's an allowance given to it. And then there's the weekly income. And then the, there's the employee, there's the student, as you can see. And it says that for consistency purposes, accept that one week is seven days one month it's 30 days, one year is this. And there's a bunch of questions here. So you first need to create these classes. You see this one is bold and italic. These are also bold italic, which means that they are enforced to the child classes. And then once you have created it, you will have to get values. There's a student, there's an employee, and then you will have to calculate their weekly and monthly income and show it on the console. If you have time, solve this exercise and bring it to the class because next lecture I will solve it uh, in the class. There are also more exercises at the end of chapter nine. You can find them in here, exercise two, which is a music maker, as you can see and also another one, which the animal. In this one, the animal is an abstract class. And there are two abstract methods, make sound and move. And there's a duck and there's a cat, which you might want to solve them to understand this concept. There's only one thing that I didn't discuss, which I want to discuss in, in the next lecture, and that is interfaces. And when I do the interfaces, we'll be done with all of the topics. Is there any question now that you would like to ask? I have two and a half minutes left. Is it clear? Did you understand this? Have a look at it. As I said, your quiz will be next week. Hopefully, if they don't cancel our classes at the last minute, we will have the quiz. All right. So this is all I wanted to talk about. If you don't have a question, I'm gonna end up the session and I will upload the video on the YouTube channel and I will share the link with you. So don't worry, you will be able to watch it again and again if you want to do so, all right? Thank you so much for coming to my session, even though this is online and BB didn't work. So I had to do the lecture on Zoom. I think we handled it quite well, right? Uh, so I'm gonna end up the lecture. So I wish you a lovely day. And uh, if you have a question, you can send me uh, an email and I'll do my best to answer whenever I can. Have a lovely day, guys. And once again, thank you for coming to my class. And I'll see you hopefully next week. Take good care.